It's crazy because a whole nation called Spain called me over to an accepting award for being number one vegan chef in Africa. And um, back home, back home, you're just <laughs> like crickets. I'm like, I want to start with dinner with Chef Cola. Uh, because I read something and I was like, yo, this sounds crazy. How was this even possible? And it was the dollar for a six course meal dinners. That was dinner with Chef Cola, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when was this and what was the thinking behind that? Rewind a little bit. I went to college in Cape Town. Yeah. 2011, I'm exposing my age. <laughs> went to college for hospitality management for, um, for three years, and then during those three years, hospitality management, not culinary art school. Yeah. Some way, some reason, I ended up on the culinary science arts as a chef. Long story. <laughs> and um, during the graduation, the process for the graduation was that you needed to go into a, de a department in the hotel for 10 weeks, um, and restaurant to hotel 10 weeks, make sure that you get the job by yourself. You've been in school for three years, and you come back and you can graduate. Yeah. I got a job at a vegan restaurant for 10 weeks. I found a job by myself. And I was so good at that job that I went from washing dishes, like typical movie, washing dishes, to now chopping onions and tomatoes and all of that, to now becoming the head chef. It was a cafe at the yeah. time called Plant. And at that time, South Africa was also picking up on the vegan movement. Yeah. And then it became Plant Restaurant, and it's still to this day one of South Africa's top traditional lead in plant restaurants. So being trained from there, um, working in that restaurant, I came back to Zimbabwe um, around 2016, and I realized that there was no vegan anything happening yeah. a lot in Zimbabwe. I could name the people who were doing the vegan things. And I decided, I decided to start African Vegan on a Budget, which is the name of my company. Yeah. And we, it was basically a vegan lifestyle company. And one of the things that we do and still do is dinner with Chef Cola. It started off whereby I would invite people, like invite my friends, celebrity friends, yeah. people in government, and people, just everyone, like, please, please come to the dinner. Yeah. And they were like, we don't want to come because it doesn't make sense, Kuti. It's a six-course meal, but then a pananyama. You know, like, African yeah. thing <laughs> meat equals wealth. Or, like, if there's no meat on the plate, then it's not a full meal. It's not like a full meal. meal, yeah. And then I kept on pushing, and I was just like, I'm still going to push, and the dinners were just a dollar. And then for I got lucky because my career was based in two countries, South Africa and Zimbabwe. So in South Africa, things were going very well, yeah. media-wise, ETC. And then BBC called and they're like, no, we're very interested in your dinner. We'd like to fly to South Africa to film it. I'm like, unfortunately, I'm based in Zimbabwe right now. Can you come to Zimbabwe? Yeah. And they came to Zim. They filmed the dinner. And then I put out a post. I'm like, filmed by BBC. <laughs> Would you like to come to my dinner? And then everyone lined up, queue knocking, thinking it was a dollar. I was like, by the way, 60 US dollars for my yeah. dinner. Because... I don't know what you take me for, but I'm a, I'm a brilliant <laughs> vegan chef and I'm an international vegan chef. So the dinner started popping off and slowly but surely um, throughout the years we would have a dinner, let's say once a month. And then because my career started um, developing a bit more whereby I'm not just a chef, um, I am an Africa regional coordinator. I work with a philanthropy company yeah. and we're responsible for giving out vegan grants to various people throughout Africa, not just Zimbabwe. Yeah. So I have that aspect of my career, then the, the vegan dinners, and I have a line of chef jackets. And then I also work a lot with um, in rural communities whereby I have programs that I work with there and then yeah. urban community where I have greenhouses. So I'm a, like a serial vegan entrepreneur. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, the vegan dinners this year, unfortunately I haven't had one, but then actually um, it's going to come up. I don't want to say the month because I don't know when it's, it's going to be aired. Yeah. But they're coming back with a, with a twist, which makes more sense because a lot of people are not doing dinners with Chef Cola. They 
taking the blueprint or a lot of people are not doing tennis so yeah. I need okay. to switch it up. Yeah, you need to like put some new life into it. Exactly. Fair enough, I hear that man. And so you touched on like a lot of things there that are like quite interesting. Um, so I, I get the sense that when you went to do like um, hotel management, um, your goal wasn't to become a chef, but you did end up becoming a chef. Mm -hmm. um, so like, when was that interest in like actually pursuing, um, when or how at least was that interest in pursuing that career specifically? Uh, when did that happen for you? Uh, when I was 16. I come from the best of both worlds, so yeah. I was born in Zimbabwe, and then at the age of three, we moved to New York, uh, Manhattan. That was like a wild experience with my yeah. family, and then we moved back to Zim, and there was a lot of things happening to everyone in Zimbabwe, so there was like a lot of hardships, yeah. and I remember, if you come from my generation, you probably come from a generation where school was open but then you didn't have enough school fees to go to school or you used to go to school in the mind and then you oh, yeah. ask your parents like so when am i going to school and you really <laughs> didn't understand what was happening but you could understand and i knew that i wanted to be in a position when i get older to give and my shoulder name is Tanegazwa, which means yeah. to comfort the people and food is comfort and i always knew that i was going to work with food and i told my twin one day like i don't know how or yeah. why, but I'm going to be a chef. And he asked me why, and I was just like, one, I don't ever want to go hungry, and two, I want to feed other people. People must always um, come to me for food. I actually have like this vision when I'm older, like in my 60s, 70s, my house will be the house where you always come to, yeah. to always get a hot meal. Yeah. No questions asked, nothing, just are There's you an open kitchen. Because you'd be surprised how someone's energy can shift by just a glass of water or just a meal and you can just make a difference like let's just sit down and have a meal yeah. i'm not trying to say that you don't have money to buy bread or whatever but sharing a meal is is a love language and yeah. let's just communicate in a beautiful way so that's what that's how that um and how that developed food right? at the age of 16. yeah yeah, yeah i love that man yeah. i i love that and i love that you uh, been able to like actualize a lot of that vision thus far, right? Thank you. Um, and so, so African vegan on a budget. Um, what is that business? And um, <clears throat> in fact, let's start with what it is and get into it a bit more. I think that's a good place to start. African vegan on a budget is a lifestyle company. Yeah. Um, internationally recognized and we just spread vegan awareness within Africa whether you're coming from a rural setting or an urban setting so yeah. if you're urban and you want to find out where can I get vegan cheese um, we are a network we can tell you okay go to vegan vibes that's the best place to go get something vegan yeah. if you're in a rural community and you want to start a project because people in rural communities i like to say that veganism originated in africa and the yeah. people are like well, what do you mean because we <laughs> we used to ride on lions and kill them and do all of that jazz and i'm like no our ancestors didn't eat as much meat as we as we do, we do now. now because yeah. of colonial reasons and yeah. when they did it was through practices like calling in rain or a wedding or funeral ceremony so if you want to i work a lot in the rural communities because they are actually vegan there's no electricity and if they do have one or two chickens or cows they're not yeah. slaughtering them every single day so yeah. they're actually on plant-based diets and now because of social media the people, whether you're in the rural community and urban, everyone is aware of themselves. Yeah. And they want to live better lifestyles, saying, okay, fine, I don't eat meat every day. I see this on social media, African vegan on a budget. How can I use what I have to, to create um, a vegan, a sustainable vegan diet? Yeah. But then not only a sustainable vegan diet, but how can I live off of this? Like vegan entrepreneurship, create a garden, ETC. Yeah, so, yeah, I hear that. Um, African vegan on the budget is a lifestyle. Yeah, it's a lifestyle yeah. company. Lifestyle. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that, man. And yeah. um, so the name African Vegan on a Budget, I think it's like a really important name because um, the, the conception that people have yeah. is that... Um, veganism is expensive yeah it's for white people yeah it's expensive like every time it yeah. comes up in conversation people are just like i can't yeah. afford that yeah, lifestyle it's rabbit food yeah, yeah. I, I can't afford the food mm. i i assume that therefore means by extension you guys like as as a company as an entity mm. um one of the things one of the biggest things you have to do is to educate educate like potential clients mm. but just educate uh, people like more broadly yeah. how do you go about that like getting to teach someone like myself who comes in with that misconception that this is an expensive lifestyle mm. i'll do this maybe 10 years from now when mm. i can afford it mm. how do i do that by it's a soft thing first educate yourself i'm always staying educated like this year i've gone on a lot of courses learning about seeds and bunch of random things so that yeah. when I speak to people at least I, I am educated um, and then also respecting someone's pivot like if they look in this direction and they're on a meat-based diet yeah. then respect that person's pivot don't try to be like no you're wrong for eating animals yeah. or it's a big fight <laughs> yeah, just that happens sometimes it's, it's so <laughs> unnecessary or you just put a bunch of pictures of animal slaughterhouses and be like no I'm going to change my mind or you make someone watch like 10 documentaries yeah. on that's not the way you're gonna turn someone vegan like just have conversations and be like okay let's have a meatless Monday or just challenge yourself one one less meal a day um, especially for people of color as we get older it's very essential for us to go on a lot of plant-based diets because most of these diseases that people of color um, are suffering from can actually be prevented or managed through plant-based diets. Yeah. So, and these are things that our communities and our cultures don't really teach us. They teach us that, no, we're going to eat that meat because yeah. meat equals wealth. But then that's not the type of wealth that they were talking about, you know? So that's why I say we're lifestyle because one day our vision is to grow, like work with pharmacists, work with nutritionists, work with yeah. scientists, work with everyone to... To like change those to perceptions. Change. Not trying to change the world, I'm not Superman, but like change. Yeah, yeah. I hear that, I hear <laughs> yeah. that. And, and, I, and I see it, man. I see just, just from researching your journey and um, reading from like the other interviews you've done, Thank you. already those conceptions are like starting to change because I was one of those people who thought this is just like so expensive like no, how man. can you like afford to live like yeah. this go speak to your girl <laughs> she'll tell you it's actually quite affordable yeah. yeah I hear that I hear that I need to do that yeah for sure <laughs> the, the next thing I would ask naturally um, is what are the challenges you face in like building this kind of a brand this is gonna be a funny challenge <laughs> Uh, no competition Ooh. because I'm like Michael Jordan like Michael Jordan used to um, be mice at awards like someone would win the award and they're like you chose that guy over me the next yeah. season he'll come in and be like that should have been my ring yeah I'm that type of person like I'm like I love competition healthy competition and I want to see more of us within this industry so that we can grow and challenge each other. So my biggest problem right now is that I've got no one to challenge yeah, me. And it is. It's, it's, <laughs> it is lonely at the top, but it's comfortable, but it's lonely. And I yeah. want to see more young chefs. I, I want to work with more young chefs, even more elder chefs who can teach us our traditional indigenous recipes. Like, where are you guys? Yeah. Because I feel like I'm stuck in the middle of the, the, I'm no longer part of the young generation, but I'm not, I'm not a part, not of the, part of the old guys. I'm yeah. here and I hold some sort of gatekeeping whereby energy needs to flow. So I want to work with everyone. So yeah. that's my challenge of finding people who actually want to be like, no, let, I want to be a vegan chef. Right now, if I go on Google and type in Zimbabwean vegan chef, I, I get tired of only seeing my name. Yeah. So that's yeah. my challenge. I hear that, man. That's, <laughs> a, that's an interesting challenge. I, yeah. I'm secure with myself. That's why I can say that, okay? <laughs> Don't be mad because you're not secure with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, and so I want to take you back uh, to a time before you were a chef, right? At least professionally. Uh, you were a DJ. 
Um, <laughs> College was crazy. <laughs> Going to school for hospitality, ended up a at chef, the same time. DJ there. <laughs> DJ stint in the middle there. Yeah, my mom was in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Are there any any parallels between those worlds? Are there any skills that you've taken from that stint as a DJ into your career as a chef? DJing and I was DJing in Cape Town and I was like one of the few female DJs at the time at the before time, yeah. the waffles and the zinches. Yeah. And I used to remember standing outside of clubs in Long Street and wanting to give people um, my mixtapes and yeah. stuff and guys would be like, okay, just give her a shot, just give her a shot. <laughs> and I'm so glad I went through those experiences because I wasn't that DJ where I was focused on nails and beauty, I was focused on just I didn't realize that there was that type of perceptions and whatnot. I was just like this. I was going to yeah. the club like this and go DJ. And it was about music. And people would look at me funny and weird, but then vibe with me, but at the same time look at me funny. Yeah. And that was God kind of training me f to become a vegan chef because people looked at me funny for the dollar meals. People looked at me funny for the veganism. And it taught me um, to stand out and have the courage to to stand in front of a crowd, whether they like you or not. And because of the DJing in Cape Town and somewhat a little bit in Zimbabwe, yeah. um, I ended up entering TV shows like Battle of the Chefs. And if I wasn't a DJ in Cape Town, I wouldn't yeah. have had that courage to be enter a competition whereby you're told amateurs or professionals can enter, we're gonna mix you up. And out of the 250 you apply, we're only gonna choose 50. And then out of that 50, then you going to, we're going to cut you down. I'm professional chef. I entered Battle of the Chefs <laughs> and then I made it just to number 10. Yeah. I really wanted that 10,000 US dollar price. Yeah. And like I entered season three and I remember crying like that money should have been mine because yeah. there's no one on that season. <laughs> and even all the other chefs can tell you that I had so much passion and I always laugh with the producer, Mr. Joseph Bunga. Like, you do realize season three, I won it because yeah. out of all your chefs in season three, I'm the one who's still doing the things right now. <laughs> I'm the like, one who's still here. So, <laughs> so things like that, like, you know, like, don't be afraid to do things that are outside of your box because being a DJ helped me become Chef Cola. Mm. And Chef Cola, helped me become, um, to have a TV show. I never thought that, I'll, I thought I'll just be a chef. Now I'm on TV. So yeah. don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone and to speak to people who don't exactly identify the same way yeah. as you. Like, because don't really understand you. They can change your pivot in a way that can change your life. Yeah. And that's one thing that I do. I talk to the most random people because God will send you angels in the form of even devils. Yeah. And it's just about receiving the message and, and you know, keeping it moving. Keeping right? it moving. There's something you touched on uh, in a few previous questions. Uh, <laughs> I talked too said, much. <laughs> Thankfully, I can keep uh, I can keep notes. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but um, what you said was um, meat equals wealth is 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 the perception, right? And um, it's kind of rooted in, in colonialism. Uh, that's, that's your belief, even from reading uh, other interviews you've done, places where you've written and stuff like that, I really got the impression that, you know, uh, the meat-based diet that we consume now um, is, is rooted in, in colonialism. Uh, explain this aspect to me like a bit more. All right. Um, just the, the simple facts that, that are there. Before I, um, these foreign nations, I'm not going to name a particular nation because yeah. I don't want to be like, oh, you're, you're anti this country. <laughs> yeah. You know who colonized who, do your research. <laughs> Before <Fair>. these <laughs> nations came and colonized us, um, we were good. We were herding animals, farming, and doing things just enough to sustain ourselves and our yeah. communities. We weren't greedy. The other side of the world, um, they were going through things like cold fronts, bad shitty weather, and just bad times. They didn't have the, the resources and like our beautiful African country um, continent has and still has. And they came and then they exploited 
our resources. Yeah. And then on top of that, they taught us, no, instead of having just one room of chickens that can roam freely, just have a nice room, one or two, three chickens, free range chickens, you're gonna have mm. one big thing and massive produce. Yeah. And by the way, you're not mass producing for yourself so that you can sustain and build your communities. You're going to mass produce so that we can take it back to our place and look lovely and everything, abuse resources. Yeah. Do your history. I'm not going to, I don't have to do the, the maths about it. Um, and because of that, I always say veganism originated in Africa. Plant-based diets originated in Africa and other indigenous communities yeah. around the world. But then because of colonial practices and the, the greediness of them and wanting to take our resources, yeah. we learned these nasty meat-eating habits that are still here today, whereby we have these big farms of, for cows and yeah. pigs and Everything. <laughs> even chickens. Like They're not allowed to, to, to grow naturally. You can grow a chicken within a week. The things that they're pumping in them, the history, like it's, it's all online. I'm not, um, I'm not a reinvention of Dr. Savi. I'm yeah. not saying something that um, is not, that no, someone no. hasn't said in a more yeah. political and fuck you type of way. Yeah. I'm just saying yeah. what it is. And that's why like, I, I always say col veganism and colonial practices go hand in hand. That's why um, even if you do your history with the Black Panthers, they were vegan. They didn't eat meat yeah. because they associated the suffering of animals to the way um, they were suffering. So it's, it's all in the books. I'm not saying anything that's new. So don't come yeah. after me. Yeah. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> people are definitely going to be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so naturally the next thing, um, I think this just flows. Uh, uh, this ties together quite, quite comfortably, right? Uh, yeah. is, is back to Black Roots, uh, yeah. which is... Um. Uh, as I read, an initiative that spreads awareness of the beauty of African culture and African vegan culture and cuisine. The Black um, to Black Roots Kitchen. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that um, the Black to Black Roots Kitchen belongs to the International anti poaching Foundation. I worked with them for five years and they're located somewhere within the um, Zambezi Valley, some secret location. Yeah. And they are the world's first vegan armed rangers and still are to date and they are badass soldiers they will whoop your ass the, they have <laughs> been responsible in a lot of um, improvements within the anti-poaching movement yeah. within um, the southern within region yeah. and mm -hmm. i was the i developed the kitchen with mr damien mandler called back to black roots he's the founder of the organization and i was the executive chef and I trained um, five to eight chefs because they've got different camps and different army bases and yeah. basically trained the flow of how the kitchen should run and how you go on a plant-based diet, making sure the soldiers have enough to eat yeah. morning, lunch, dinner, snacks, and also what they eat when they're in the bush. So developing army ration packs and thinking about ways that are environmentally friendly whereby you don't have to use fire to, um, to to cook you we just make nice ration packets yeah. and the black to black roots kitchen is just an epic vegan kitchen located in zimbabwe that needs more shout outs yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it sounds it sounds badass it yeah. sounds crazy vegan. it sounds really cool yeah. so all of the the, the soldiers uh, the 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 officers there are on that like vegan diet mm -hmm. you have to be vegan um one thing that i respected about the founder Damien was there, he said it doesn't make sense to protect the animals and the wildlife and then come back to camp and say that and eat an animal yeah, yeah. and say that we're about anti poaching. And it made me change my perception about all of these other organizations that are like, no, we're saving the animals, but then I come back and then you feed me an animal. Yeah. It doesn't make yeah. sense. You need to go vegan. So yeah, I hear that. Yeah. I hear that and, and, and I love that. Um, one of the things that we touched on uh, before we actually uh, started uh, speaking with the camera on, right, was um, how the... You've gotten a lot of media recognition outside of Zim. You actually touched on it in this interview where you said, you know, the BBC flew yeah. over and came. Yeah. You've been covered by Forbes. Um, 
I think a number of essay uh, publications, yes, so the World, crazy. the Guardian. It's crazy. The a lot CNN, of these, like, everyone, yeah. they all love me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, back home. Uh, oh, and then I don't. I don't think I've seen any hype. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm trying to think like during my research did I come across any article of yours from 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 Zim? I don't think so. It's crazy because a whole nation called Spain called me over to an accept an award for being number one vegan chef in Africa. And um back home. Back home you're just <laughs> like crickets. I'm like Are we actually there's COVID? Are we still in COVID? Like what's happening here? Like nothing, crickets. And I'm like What's happening? Is it gatekeeping? Is the media yeah, and Yeah, because that's what I was going to ask you is like, why do you think that's the case that you've been a chef for almost a, a decade, almost a decade yeah. right? Yeah. But like, I'm right. the first media practitioner who yeah. gets to, and thank you for that, thank by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the first media practitioner who gets to sit down with you in Zim. I don't know, because I think, you know, Zim is so sensitive. Yeah. If you say like it's because of this, they'll be like, "Saga talk to one man, you chef yeah. Yeah. So you gotta be like really sensitive, <laughs> like walking in eggshells, like, not even an eggshell. You want, <laughs> like you, <ooh. laughs> like, like, <laughs> yeah, it I was so hear that. sensitive, I and I'm just hear like, that. you know, I was explaining like being recognized internationally is amazing, but at the end of the day, I'm probably Zimbabwean. Whether mm. you choose to acknowledge me. Um, or not, I'm very probably Zimbabwean. Um, I look different, I dress different, I'm unique, but I'm still probably Zimbabwean. Yeah. And I'm just gonna go out there by myself. And one of my homies taught me about guerrilla marketing. And she was just like, no, just guerrilla market, guerrilla market, reach out to these people. If they don't wanna reach out to you, next, next, next. Um, it's so funny, I don't know how to answer the question where by Forbes. CNN, BBC, National Geographic yeah. can acknowledge you, but then you give. Um, I can't even mention an establishment yeah. because talk to one chef. Yeah, I so, get it. It's, like, <laughs> it's like, a very um, <laughs> political. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's a. I don't know. Maybe yeah. veganism is not quite interesting. Maybe people don't eat. I don't know. Yeah. I see. I'm just kidding. Like, I don't know. <laughs> That's, yeah, that, that's the question, isn't it? Like, yeah, maybe meat <laughs> equals well. Maybe I should put some meat. Maybe if I, I was using meat, and and like everyone maybe, would be like, hey, know, maybe let's, more let's makeup go. and longer hair, let's lashes, it. and you know, like maybe I'll be on like Sim celebs. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you mentioned the name. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm too, too guy anyway. <laughs> Name redacted. Name <laughs> redacted, but I love everyone in Zimbabwe and I love all the media networks because one thing I do know for sure about all of them is that yeah. they do know of Chef Cola. So shout out. Fair enough. <laughs> shout out. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> the last thing I'll ask you. Um, you've been in New York. Uh, I don't know if you have you practiced there. Have you, pra mm -hmm. so you haven't practiced. Yeah. You're still like young, right? Mm -hmm. But you've practiced in in, in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. You've practiced in Zim. Mm -hmm. um, what would you take from Cape Town, like culturally, and bring it to Zim? And what would you take from Zim, culturally and food-wise, and take it to Cape Town? Yeah, that's a good question. Cape Town is such a metropolitan city, a little bit of everything everywhere, and it's so yeah. accepting. I'd love to see that here. Here, oh, like they're like open-minded? Open-minded, like open even the way people dress. Um, you can dress the way you want, you can speak the way you want. People are so creative. Yeah. It's like a, a mini New York. Zimbabwe is so traditional. We're very traditional, we're very respectful, we're very yeah. hard-working people. And even anywhere in the world, you can go anywhere in the world, you will find a Zimbabwean and that person will be like, you. These people work hard. Yeah. They, they work hard, they're respectable, they're intelligent, they're brilliant. So I would love to see that more in right. more parts of the yeah. world, more, more Zimbabwean. Some people will be like, what the, we're everywhere. We don't need to be like, we're not minions, but <laughs> I think we need more minions yeah. like us that um, that's what I would love to take away to, and that's what I take away when I go represent Zimbabwe outside of, the, um, outside of Zimbabwe. I always put my best foot forward. Um, 
saying the amazing things because you always find someone being like, yeah, how's your, how's your cousin? How's your father there? What is he doing with yeah. this? And what is he doing with that? I'm like, Zimbabwe is very beautiful. Yeah. The weather is amazing. Then this and this. And I'm like, Bob's my cousin, yes, but I'm still, <laughs> I have a nice cousin. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. Yeah, my cause, cousin. Because <laughs> people have this thing where they associate like certain things, certain things with the place, mm. but it's always like, we have lived in it's such a broader. beautiful country. It's always broader than It's so matches. quiet outside like and we're just minding our own business we're yeah. working you like and we help each other like if you have a problem we're such a, a family orientated nation yeah. um the, every family has that drunken uncle or that one auntie yeah. but then <laughs> at the end of the day we're such a beautiful nation so that's what i would love to take out of the world and that's what i actually make sure that i do um, when you go yeah. Out there. yeah i love yeah. that